You are watching programming from the East-West Center in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me uh, call the proceedings to order, as it were. Um, my name is Satu LeMay. I'm the Vice President of the East-West Center and the Director of the East-West Center in Washington. This is our first in-person plus hybrid virtual event that we've done since um, March 2020. And so we're delighted, uh, of course, to have our colleague, Dr. Jagannath Banda with us today on an incredibly timely and uh, interesting issue relating to India and the Sino-Russian reordering in Eurasia. So uh, welcome, Jagannath, uh, from Stockholm. Um, and welcome to those of you who are joining online and those of you who have uh, joined in person. We're delighted to have some guests in person and hopefully this will become a more normal and regular uh, process. Um, as you know, uh, Jagannath is the head of the Stockholm Center for South Asian and Indo-Pacific Affairs. And uh, he um, um, is uh, you know, well known in the strategic and security circles. He, spent many years at the Institute for Defense Analyses in uh, Delhi. Um, he writes uh, prolifically and incredibly interestingly on a range of regional topics. We've had the good fortune of having Jagannath publish in East-West Center publications and speak here before. And so we're delighted to have his views on the topic at hand, which is India and the Sino-Russian reorder in Eurasia. He'll speak for about 30, 35 minutes. Um, we'll take Q&A, uh, obviously, from those who are present in the room, but also uh, from uh, online, uh, those watching on YouTube live stream as well our, as our Zoom room. So welcome, Jagannath, and over to you, and welcome to all of our guests. Thank you. Thank you, Sato. It's always a pleasure to be here in the East West Center. My pleasure, in fact, my privilege to be here uh, as the first in-person meeting, but it's wonderful to have you as uh, the moderator always, and... Uh, I do um, recall my interactions here uh, three years back, I suppose, and we are talking precisely almost on the same topic about Quad and Indo Pacific, that how you know the, the situation in Indo Pacific is evolving. Particularly, we are caught in a strategic dilemma at this moment, particularly given the background of what is happening in US, um, particularly keeping in view the Ukraine war. Uh, triggered by Russia, um, how the Indo-Pacific under you know the, the undercurrents in Indo-Pacific is going to evolve, um, and there is a lot of discussion about India's position about the you know uh, about the Ukraine and Russia war. Uh, you know, last one week uh, I've been here in DC testifying uh, on Thursday about China's interference in South Asia, how China is emerging as a actor in South Asia. I could see there is a lot of debate and discussion in the DC circuit about uh, India's position. And rightfully, probably, there is a lot of sincerity. There is a lot of criticism about India's position. Primarily because um, it's an emotional context emerging. Um, and uh, so we will be discussing some of these issues. But uh, as you could see from the slides, I have uh, prepared the randomly few slides, uh, collected two slides, so that uh, you know, I can show it as a reference point, but you are free to um, ask anything of your interest out of this presentation, because most of these issues are interlinked and we don't have a uh, you know, structured environment to discuss about uh, you know, the geopolitics, because it's, uh, it's in fluid. A lot of things are ignored. But one of the um, critical points, and that's the critical um, uh, you know, point about my presentation today, that where does really India stand? when it comes to the U.S.N. politics and Indo-Pacific politics. Of course, U.S.N. politics and Indo-Pacific politics, we are not really uh, mixing uh, with each other. They are different. But then um, they are definitely internal. I am currently based in Stockholm, and I could clearly see that the core European communities are reassessing their approach to the global politics right now. There was a time, as you could recall, that Europe was actually reviewing about its own approach towards Indo-Pacific after the AUKUS agreement happened. Probably most part of the Europe, the, they saw the AUKUS agreement, um, you know, the UK, the US, and Australia trilateral technological submarine agreement are not in favor of them. But today, after the Ukraine war, 
probably the most uh, part of the Europe is uh, you know revisiting their approach towards Indo-Pacific, and I could see that probably they are seeing Indo-Pacific in a new context, in a new um, way, and there is a lot of positivity approach uh, you know is visible in the European approach to Indo-Pacific. So in that context, India's position becomes very critical because India is a critical actor in the Indo-Pacific. But we know for a fact that given India's traditional foreign policy posture, um, Rosa has been a partner and China is de definitely has been a developmental partner. So where does really India stand as far as the geopolitics in Eurasia is concerned, the geopolitics in Indo-Pacific is concerned? So in order to discuss that, let me share with you a few, um, you know, um, uh, critical points that uh, probably you and some of some of them who are listening to this talk would be interested to understand. That uh, where does really India stands and who stands where? Where you can stand and in that context, what is India's position? And is really India's position supportive to you towards Russia, or um, uh, there is a India connect is visible in the China Russia? Uh, India trilateral, and that's why India wants to appear as a more supportive power to the Russian uh, position on the Ukraine. What are the current affairs as far as India China relations is concerned, and uh, what are the ground realities now? And how India China relations is going to shape the Eurasian politics and Indo Pacific politics in times to come? And of course, how India is looking at the chemistry that is evolving between, uh, between China and Russia. And I think these are some of the issues uh, probably we will be discussing. But one of the first points that we need to talk about that who is standing with uh, as far as the Ukraine war is concerned, and I think the world is divided. Uh, but it's divided rightfully um, because, um, you know, uh, it's an emotional uh, outbreak in Europe currently. And uh, most of the sentiments are with the Ukraine. But even though we know for a fact that most of the um, uh, foreign policy standings are with Ukraine. There is a solid solidarity support towards Ukraine's cause, and the world, including um, the Indo Pacific partners, are supporting uh, NATO alliance partners are supporting Ukraine. But there is one power that is uh, the Indo Pacific power, which is a critical defense security partner of uh, United States of America, that is India, um, which has kept a little ambivalent neutral position on the Ukraine. So what is India's position? Shall we call it a neutral position? Or we will call it more a position aligned towards Russian position or China or uh, combined position? I think we need to understand India's position from a range of factors. Um, and uh, if we see, I mean, I think there has been a couple of uh, uh, you know, bad questions in the media briefings um, towards the Indian official. Um, that, uh, you know, where does really India stand on the Ukraine war and uh, what is India's stand? And uh, probably Delhi has uh, tried to, you know, divert the attention, not addressing those questions and also not condemning the Russians' um, invention uh, on Ukraine. But I think within that um, diversion, there is a uh, position India has taken. And the position that India has taken, that it has say that the respect of territorial integrity and sovereignty of all states should be respected. So even though India has not really been very vocal about condemning Russia's position, and India has, you know, side away in terms of probably taking a more outright, um, upfront and, uh, you know, overt position officially to condemn the Russian attack, but India has also said that the respect of territorial integrity and sovereignty should be respected. And I think that explains India's position. Probably India wants that the peace should be maintained and the war should be ended. And um, in a way, India has encouraged and said that there should be peaceful dialogue. So India's position is somewhat caught in a strategic dilemma because of its own uh, past, uh, you know, connections with Russia and China. But if you see the analyze more from a scholarly framework, from a critical viewpoint. India's uh, uh, standpoint um, on the Ukraine war, and particularly uh, between China and Russia, there are plus and that there are minuses. Uh, we know that you know if we see the Indian position, India's position is emerging somewhat similar like the Chinese position, and both India and China have uh, abstained from the UNSC and the UNS, uh, United Nations uh, General Assembly uh, voting, um, and. Uh, uh, in fact, India has been, you know, um, uh, 
not supported economic sanctions against others. So <coughs> to that extent, probably one can say India complements the Chinese position or probably shares a complementarity with China. And probably this is for a definite strategic plan, definite keeping India's national interest in India. And also, and I think there are growing criticism and cynicism in, being increased about India's position. Primarily because if you see these two maps which I have made, um, that uh, you know, India's energy imports from Russia has also increased during the... So there is this continuous allegation comes against India that you know, India is supporting the Russians' plan and uh, probably becoming a facilitator to Russia's national plan and uh, global interest as far as the uh, Ukraine war is concerned. But within that thing, I think India is also very critical uh, about, uh, you know, Russia's um, invention plan and uh, India has not really been supportive when it comes to, you know, triggering the war. Um, and therefore, we, we can say that, uh, you know, in fact, uh, during the war, uh, when the war is still on, um, India has, uh, you know, uh, has established good connections with most of the European powers. And Mr. Modi has visited, visited Europe. There has been, you know, uh, discussion among the European countries, European powers, including with the European, lead, uh, including with the top European leadership and leadership from the UK. India has provided, you know, um, uh, um, uh, aid and uh, uh, donations to the Ukrainian schools. Courts. So, therefore, one can say that India is caught in a strategic dilemma. But within that complementarities, there are a lot of complexities and contradictions between India and China's position, which actually makes the politics in Eurasia very few. And therefore, I would not really be uh, confirming anything or you know, uh, giving my final judgment here because the politics is still evolving, the war is still on. But within that, there is a trend emerging, and I think this trend has to be understood in terms of both complementarity, complexity, and contradictions that both India and China hold towards Russia. Now, as far as the Chinese position is concerned towards the Ukraine war, I think we know that the China overtly supports Russia, and that's for a definite game plan because. China's position is to build an anti-US, anti-Western stand, um, anti-Western front as much as possible, and probably pressurize um, as much as possible the American game plan, the NATO's game plan in the in the Russian process. And the Chinese are also, um, you know, uh, very thoughtful about their belt and road uh, initiative. Even though we don't know whether Xi Jinping is going to really pursue the belt and road initiatives in the same manner. Uh, after the pandemic, because now this year probably there will be um, you know party congress and then he will be going for the third term, and once the, one is not really sure in Chinese politics how it evolve, but it looks like Xi Jinping is going to continue in power for another term. So as far as the Chinese game plan is concerned, they would ensure that their Belt and Road Initiative, particularly the Silk Road Economic Belt projects, um, continue to flourish in the Western regions. And the Chinese, they do see this is an opportune moment because there is a lot of backlash against Russia in the European regions in the US and And probably the Chinese would like to fill out the gap that uh, Russia is creating in the broader European regions or in the US and Today, I think uh, the whole European uh, community is getting united against Russia. And the Chinese would like to cap you know, capitalize on making an inroads to, uh, in to Europe. Even though we know for a fact that uh, China, Europe, uh, strategic economic, uh, you know, partnership is still not really at a stronger market and their economic um, um, agreement is still unfolding and it, it has not really been finalized. In fact, the last meeting was really, uh, you know, ended abruptly. But still, the Chinese are hopeful to make a greater inroads to the European communities, given the kind of vacuum that the Russians are making through attacking the uh, UK. Uh, on the other hand, if you try to analyze, it looks like India's position uh, is somewhat neutral, but at the same time, there is a tactical support to Rosa, and this tactical support to Rosa is for a definite reason. It is based on India's national security concerns. It is based on India's national interests, and there are a number of reasons why uh, Delhi wants to be um, not, seems to appear anti Rosa. Uh, Though it is also subjective to say how much India is really supportive to us, 
But I think I would uh, make this point and I won't hesitate to say that probably it appears that India is very supportive to Rosa. But let's understand India's support to Rosa is very calculated, very tactical, and that's based on India's national interest. And I think there are three or four um, issues that there we need to really talk about. One is that I think that there is defense partnership of the military um, forces that uh, India continuously um, uh, does from Rosa. Uh, we know for a fact, fact that you know 60 percent of the India's uh, military equipments comes from Rosa. That's not a small number. India would like to continue with that. So, and there also, what we need to understand is that India's relationship with Rosa is very much, when it comes to the defense issues, it's very much a business client relationship. It's not a strategic partnership. Even though it, on the official front, it, it, it appears that it's a strategic partnership. And that's why India is strongly connected with Rosa in terms of uh, military equipment policies. But it's a business-oriented partnership. It's a client, business client, uh, uh, seller uh, partnership. We we pay and we purchase the Russian uh, uh, So uh, it is a uh, give and take kind of a uh, you know uh, you know, partnership, business model-oriented partnership. So there is there is nothing emotional about India uh, that uh, India holds about us. Second, I think uh, the energy uh, and I think the gas and the oil energy. Uh, imports that you see in this map. Uh, I mean, it is one thing to say that Delhi's uh, oil imports or the uh, energy imports from Rosa is a uh, big, big factor. But if we see this map, I think it's just a small factor. India imports oil from many countries. But I think the imports we do from Rosa comes way bigger. But yes, I think during the war, um, India purchased a little more amount from Rosa, and I think that has been a subject of debate. The third factor, I think, is the multilateral contacts. Uh, I can discuss about it during the q and I, but very softly trying to explain that why India has not really been overtly anti towards Rosa is due to the number of multilateral contacts that India shares with us, um, and I think. It, it, it goes with the U.S. and politics. It, it goes with the politics that India shares with both Russia and China. Even though India's foreign policy during the pandemic has become strongly anti-China. But I think there are a number of multilateral forums, be it BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, um, be it Russia, India, China, China. Uh, be it Songhai Cooperation Organization. I think there are a range of multilateral um, platforms that in Delhi shares with Rosa and China, which has in a way encouraged Delhi not to be overtly critical about Rosa's military uh, And I think the fourth factor is that I think this has to be understood from uh, India's evolving foreign policy. Um, that complements Japanese foreign policy, that complements many major powers foreign policy in the Pacific and I think the crux of the politics here is the connectivity. India for a long time is searching for alternative connectivity routes to U.S. and we need Russians. We need uh, a, a range of support from Russia and China in terms of finding an alternative route to, to U.S. I can discuss about those issues um, um, much more later. But again, if you talk about uh, the, the defense ties, which has been the most important uh, factor between India and Russia, uh, and I think um, uh, it will take a long time for India to say no to Russia. And I think it will take probably more than a decade because we know for a fact that uh, uh, you know you cannot just outrightly um, disband your existing. Um, arms and ammunition, which you have been procuring from Soviet Union times from Russia. So I think this is a strong factor that India would not like to really give up. Second, the new energy factor, even though at this moment uh, there is a lot of revisit about, um, particularly among the European countries, and I could see uh, the way Europe is debating, that uh, you know, a lot of countries, they have uh, stopped having energy imports from Russia, but still I think most of the European countries are also having a 
emotional breakdown into the ministry. And there is a revisit on the energy import from Bosa uh, because of that. But how long it will continue, that has to be said. Uh, hypothetically saying, if the war is here, ending in another uh, couple of months or six months, and let's say in two years' time from now on, uh, should we assume and say that uh, the European community would not really revisit in terms of importing um, energy from us? How, how credible would be that sign for it? How long? The European communities or the individual European actors are going to say no to the Russian energy, you know, importing energy from us. I think these are critical issues, and we don't have any uh, right way, you know, ready made answer to some of these questions. The war is on, and I think the geopolitics is evolving. So at this moment, most of the issues look emotional, and I think uh, uh, we have to be very careful before making any uh, assumption or a final judgment on this. But I think one factor which would also be a backgrounder in terms of shaping India's perception towards both Eurasian politics as well as you know um, uh, not moving away too much from US and the Quad and from the Indo-Pacific is the India-China relations, India's relationship with China. And I think that will be one of the critical variables. We need to see how China India relationship is evolving and how the Chinese are trying to see India. And I think you would agree with me that um, Probably we have seen a slightly dramatic shift in China's position um, immediately uh, after the Ukraine war. The Chinese doesn't want to sound like that aggressive as any power, and there has been already few efforts from the Chinese in terms of rebuilding the relationship with India, uh, and uh, they, therefore, you know, one they visited India in terms of uh, trying to improve the relationship. Though I think uh, we have to see that how, uh, how much this kind of a political and uh, diplomatic overtures will really amend the ties uh, between China and India and whether it will help uh, to rebuild the ties. But um, my, my uh, take here is that normalization between China and India will take some time. Um, and I think the Chinese have damaged their relationship with India so much during the pandemic. It will take time, uh, at least in the better India's diplomatic and political fraternity to raise some kind of confidence, uh, um, which is not uh, definitely uh, entirely uh, impossible to make. But uh, because in Delhi strategic circuit, there are a chunks of diplomats, chunks of strategic thinkers who still think that uh, if India has to manage the relationship with China, India has to, you know, uh, uh, improve the relationship with China and vice versa. So there is a section in Delhi who still thinks that it is better to main waste uh, uh, the relationship with China, even though I don't really see that uh, normalization happening in the near past. But I think one thing we have to keep it in mind, that the Galwan episode is not yet over between China and India. Um, and we know for a fact there are troops deployment uh, there, and uh, the troops withdrawal will take, is taking time, and probably uh, they would not, um, uh, probably outright, the Chinese would not really uh, like to vacate the areas they have captured uh, or uh, stationed at this moment, and uh, that will take some time. And I think, therefore, I would not really be very optimistic about China and their relations. But I think here, Russia factor comes as a significant background. Um, and I think this is what we need to see that why India is taking a calculative position uh, when it comes to the UK and Russia, because India has more to gain in terms of not spoiling the relationship with Russia, rather than you know taking a direct position, uh, a position against Russia and losing out many things. Um, and, the, and one of the critical national interest is that to balance the China flow, to balance the China culture. And I think even though Russia cannot really uh, help much in terms of building up the normalization, of, um, normalizing the China and relations, but we know for a fact when the Golan incident was uh, happening. Uh, you know, Putin did try to stick to Xi Jinping uh, to, you know, uh, try to subdue the situation and try to, to improve the situation and not to go for a tense relationship with India. And I think that has been Russian efforts. Russia doesn't want to give up on its tribal relationship uh, with, with China and India. Uh, and I think we can discuss some of these issues later on. But I think as far as China and their relation is concerned, I think what we know for a fact that currently, the, the Chinese positions, the Chinese troops withdrawal is happening, Indian troops withdrawal is happening, but still probably 
or this withdrawal has not ha has not really taken place to a to a level where you could withdraw optimism by saying that Golwan is over. Golwan is here to stay, and I think the principal relationship between China and India will persist for some time. And I think uh, the Golwan incident was orchestrated in some ways as a response to the Dukram incident, which happened in 2017. Because I have held this point that uh, you know the Dukram incident was uh, seen by the PLA as a kind of a moral loss. The way Indian troops actually uh, crossed the international line of uh, control and stood in the Dukram Valley to face the PLA and obstruct them not to construct the road for 73 days. So PLA took it as a moral loss. And uh, since that time, there was a built up was happening in the Chinese strategy circuit that you know um, um, India needs to be kept in control and India's in so uh, this is what uh, the, the point I was trying to make last week uh, in, the, in the Congress, that the Chinese approach towards India, particularly factoring the China-India boundary dispute, is very calculated. So what today we are seeing on the boundary issue is a very calculated conflict. It's not a really a full-fledged conflict. Even though during the Cold War, Cold War incident, we saw there were casualties from the Indian side and from the Chinese side. But it is a calculated front. We can discuss about those. So the boundary is true. The boundary tension between China and India is not over. That will be a, a, a barrier in India-China Russia and India-China relations. But again, I think India is looking at the greater picture. And therefore, India's position is a very careful position, very, um, you know, um, very, very careful, uh, as well as very, um, you know, indicating a kind of tactical support towards Russia. Because there are other critical issues on the ground that India is factoring in its geopolitics. Uh, we are looking for a um, entry to the Eurasian regions, to the Central Asia for a long time. Um, we have a connect Central Asia policy. We have a link West policy. So they are actually having a good relations with Russia has been critical to India's strategic interest, given Russia's you know. Uh, security interest in Pakistan, given Russia's security interest in Afghanistan regions, given Russia's interest towards the up, up Pakistan, up Park region, uh, including uh, with, 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 with China and Central Asia, I think uh, India has been careful in terms of not taking an anti China position, uh, anti Russia position. But I think one of the factors which would also be shaping and testing India's position is that the connectivity politics. Um, and uh, this is where we need to see that how the Chinese are trying to reset uh, who's the pandemic uh, when it comes to the Belt and Road initiatives. And I think Belt and Road initiatives has been the um, you know one of the um, critical foreign policy and national uh, uh, project of Xi Jinping. Um, and uh, Xi Jinping would definitely like to continue um, you know pushing uh, the Belt and Road initiative to the next level. So. We know for a fact that when it comes to the Belt and Road initiatives, it is based on a 5C strategy. Uh, the Chinese are trying to promote connectivity infrastructure, they are trying to promote corridors, they are trying to build relationships with the uh, neighbors, cooperations with the neighbors, and they are building country specific routes. As well as have, they have a continental outreach plan. And the six corridors are designed in some ways to facilitate that kind of 5C strategy. But what is more interesting to note is that probably the Chinese would probably would be aiming to use both China, uh, both both India and Russia to their advantage in the multilateral platform. And this is where we need to talk about some of these Euro, Eurasian geopolitical uh, groupings. Shanghai Cooperation Organization is one. I mean, I can I can take some of these questions uh, during the Q and A, uh, but when it comes to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization trades. A new development bank, AIIB, RIC. It would be interesting to see how India and Russia are approaching these multilateral um, organizations because the Chinese would be holding a lot of importance to these multi multilateral agencies. These multilateral agencies have been critical variables in Chinese foreign policy for a long time. The Chinese are actually, um, you know, promoting a kind of a their multilateral outreach. Um, uh, towards the regions, towards the US and regions, factoring both South Asia and Central Asia for a long time. Uh, India has been roped in to SEO, of course, with Ross and so forth. But again, it has to see that how all of this multilateral platform will emerge 
in the post pandemic period or in the post ukraine uh, war period is india really going to stay in some of this multilateral platforms is india is going to you know give adequate importance to some of this uh, platform maybe you can discuss during the q and a but my take here very brief uh, take here would be i think india will be continuing its association with some of this multilateral organizations including the co including the aid uh, because um, india does uh, look at its own national interest as we could see from the energy inputs as we could see from the uh, defense engagement with russia india would like to see some of these projects uh, continue in fact aid has a uh, strong outreach in india so india would not like to uh, stop some of these projects if india does that probably the relationship with russia and china would be affected but i think what is really um, interesting here is to understand probably that what would be india's take on um, uh, russia china relations uh, what i call a kind of sino russian real in us which is emerging and i think that that is going to be one of those interesting topics we have to continuously watch <coughs> but i think delhi would be watching carefully how much how much uh, russia is offering to india and what kind of bargaining and concession is emerging between india and russia vis-a-vis uh, -vis china uh, as far as delhi's foreign policy position is, is concerned it has become very anti china india would not really like to appear or india would not really like to do something which would uh, really be blindly again supporting chinese plan or you know having a, a same kind of rapport that uh, prime minister modi actually aim to um, promote with xi jinping during the informal summit in wuhan summit or during the chinese summit i think delhi won't be doing that list delhi will be more careful about china so india would be carefully monitoring how china was a chemistry are evolving and what kind of space india is offered as far as the central asia politics is concerned how much india is giving a gateway uh, to the central asian politics that will actually uh, you know um, decide a lot but again i think there is also caught in a lot of strategic computation and calculation right now um, and and um, that will be my last point to say that even though in delhi there is a realization that ukraine crisis is not a similar kind of crisis like the taiwan if we have assumed that uh, tomorrow the pla is occupying taiwan forcefully it might not really be the same kind of uh, conflict i think the taiwan conflict will be of of course of a different nature um uh, that might in world japan that might be more uh, united states directly um when the war will come to uh, you know rescue to the taiwan that's again a debatable issue but i think delhi is really realizing um, uh, continuously one thing that probably war will take time to emerge as a stronger group um there are issues within the quad formulations which needs to be debated needs to be discussed before delhi really sounds or appears fully committed even the india is very committed in terms of promoting the quad as a multilateral organization as a multilateral multilateral forums but uh, india does not want to appear as a um, alliance partner of the quad because quad is still an open field quad there is no uh, agreement per se within the quad formulations india would like to invest as far as uh, soft security issues are concerned india would like to be a strong partner but when it comes to the military alliance exercises delhi would like to see how much uh, india's security interests are protected in the indus how much a uh, quad would like to rescue in terms of uh, you know giving a security guarantee to india's security interest vis-a-vis -vis china on the border issues so i think the geopolitics in indo pacific would have a uh you know serious implications uh, from the ukraine war and i think here the testing point here, here is you know, how far the india's relationship with the us will be going of course i don't see any problem i think even though dc today is critical about delhi's position on ukraine war but i don't think um uh, ukraine and russia crisis is such a point where delhi and dc will be divided for forever there have been iran crisis there has been uh, you know civil nuclear agreement where delhi and dc has not agreed so outrightly uh, on north korean issues they have not agreed uh, so um, in short please so there has been issues but that has not really divided uh, a permanent divide between india and us in fact rather uh, i would say that all of this main problems like iran crisis north korea crisis the civil nuclear disagreement when it was there before the agreement was signed 
uh, all of these uh, issues have actually in a way um, helped India and US to come closer and check out for a bigger uh, partnership. So uh, I think uh, all of this crisis has helped India and US to move to the next level. So I don't really see the Ukraine crisis or the Russia as uh, military actions against Ukraine is going to be a barrier between India and US. But again, a uh, lot has to be discussed between Delhi and this. The second point is about India and Japan. I wrote a piece uh, a week back between India and Japan that probably there is, there is there, there appears to be a divide between India and uh, Japan on the Ukraine issue because uh, India did not really allow the Japanese um, SDF uh, you know, planes to land um, in its territory. But I think these are probably because of uh, lack of communications and lack of uh, proper diplomatic nexus understanding. Um, I don't think it is a um, big factor to affect India-Japan relations. India-Japan relationship is on a much more stable framework today, pathway today, so it will continue to flourish. Uh, but most interesting thing here would be, even the Prime Minister Modi recently traveled to EU, to what extent the broader European community will see India as an effective partner. Because as I am based there in Europe, I can see one thing is that the broader European communities are very critical about India's position because India has been appearing quite supportive to us also. Um, so I think uh, dis despite of Euro's cynicism or critical um, stand towards uh, Delhi or towards India, I would say that India's relationship with the EU, European Union, or say will improve, will strengthen, because EU will see India and of course Japan uh, as two of the critical Indo-Pacific partners, and EU's focus on Indo-Pacific will continue to stay. What about Quad? And I think uh, you know I have been asked in the DC circuit about how Delhi is looking at the Quad. I don't think there is any problem in Delhi's approach standpoint about the Quad. Uh, and I think very soon uh, next week we are having going to have a Quad meeting in in, in Tokyo. But I think uh, Delhi will appear confident and probably Delhi will ensure that its interest is more is with the Quad, more with the Indo-Pacific like-minded countries rather than with the US and powers. Uh, uh, like uh, Rosa and uh, China. So I think Delhi will sideline more with the Indo Pacific as an Indo Pacific actor. So India's interest in war and commitment to war will continue to strengthen uh, despite of the, con you know, despite of the intention that we are getting probably Delhi is not really that serious on the war. But I think a couple of points uh, I'll end here by saying that I think what factor that uh, will um, save India's perceptions towards Indo-Pacific a lot is that how much we are actually partnering on the connectivity issues, on the on the, the infrastructure politics. India needs a lot of investments. And I think Japan has emerged as a stronger partner over the last one decade. Um, but again, I think the same kind of commitment has to be seen from other Indo-Pacific partners. And also to what extent India can solidify its partnerships with US, with the Quad countries in the Indo-Pacific supply chain networks to um, a sea line of communications. But I think here two things um, uh, where India's position will continue to um, you know, be somewhat appear like very ambivalent and contradictory is that India knows for a fact that the Ukraine war has created a situation where US-led order or US-led security architecture is here to strengthen it. Because there will be a lot of focus on Indo-Pacific. Uh, Europe is going to commit more on Indo-Pacific. So in, to what extent India can commit and be a partner in terms of going against the Russian and Chinese plan that has to be seen. The second is that I think India would also be caught in a strategic contradiction when the Sino-Russian alliance solidifies um, with the background of the Ukraine crisis. And probably North Korea will be taken into confidence with, you know, by the Chinese, uh, by, the, by the Russians. So there India has to see where its interest really lies and whether India would really factor its interest more with the Indo-Pacific region or in the Eurasian regions. That choice India has to make. But I think India would like to make a choice that its interest lies more with the Indo-Pacific regions rather than on the in, in the Eurasian regions. But I'll stop here with this uh, initial uh, few remarks and uh, probably welcome some of your comments and questions if you have. Thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you very much, Jagannath, and uh, we'll, we will turn to Q&A and also if there are any questions from those watching online.
But let me uh, begin by making a couple of observations on your presentation, for which I thank you. And now having you based in Europe also is a really interesting addition to your perspectives on this. Uh, the first observation I would make is you gave us tactical reasons why India's, to explain India's decision on Russia, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And you gave us strategic ones. And um, the tactical ones are well known to this group. We just went over arms exports, energy, uh, overlapping multilateral institutions, um, a UN uh, veto in the Security Council on issues that matter to India, et cetera. So those are tactical. Uh, and the strategic ones you brought up uh, were about um, you know, dealing with China, essentially. And I guess I'm puzzled. Uh, by two things, and I lay out two questions to you. One is, which matters more, tactical or strategic? Because clearly the immediate responses of Russia, uh, of India, are on Russia are seem very tactical and not very strategic. Um, because if it's a strategic factor, um, which is the, the concern that relations with China are only going to get worse, um, that's not aligning with Europe and with the United States which would seem bigger and better bets to deal with China in the future, and Japan. So that's the first question. The second question related to this tactical strategic divide is um, really about, uh, you kind of brought in the US there, but as an American, I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, the US barely factors into Indian calculations in this episode at all. It's access to Central Asia, it's AIB projects, which are you know, fairly small, limited. So am I to take away that all this rapprochement, all this US investment in the India relationship? I mean, after all, to a certain extent, what's this, to me, the surprise is not what India's position is on Russia. The surprise is somewhat that the US has been so accommodating about India's position on Russia, proceeding with the Quad, proceeding with the Modi visit, et cetera. So my own sense is, if this is the payoff, quote, payoff for India, for the India relationship and the India strategic enterprise, US strategy on India is being met by tactical Indian responses on Russia. So what's at work? And the fourth and final thing, I mean, third or fourth, whatever it is, I don't think I'll say on, on your presentation is, I guess what's puzzling to me is every country will act in its own self-interest as they define them, as they perceive them, perfectly legitimate. I guess I see no inkling that India's fundamental tenets of strategic autonomy, of multipolarity, which are essentially metrics of defining whether your strategy has changed. There's no evidence of that strategic change at all. What are, so what are we to make of an India relationship? What are the, what can we expect? Great. Uh, uh, I think those are fascinating questions. I wish I have answers to everything, but I think I'm yeah. sure you do. <laughs> but I think your first question is almost uh, on the same point where I ended. That India's foreign policy will appear to be contradictory in times to come. And that's for different reasons, as you rightly probably mentioned, that every national, every nas every national interest um, are uh, you know um, has their foreign policy and, and domestic uh, uh, factors to account for, and therefore India has a, this ambivalent position between tactical and strategic uh, uh, stance uh, uh, as far as the Ukraine Russia is concerned. I think here my your question was that where does really China factors and the China threat factors in Indian foreign policy and whether India will make a decision or not. I think this decision has already been made, made during the pandemic. I think the way the Chinese messed up the relationship with India during the pandemic, um, the kind of acquisition we saw and the kind of uh, casualties we saw. Um, therefore, I mentioned that. The relationship between China and India is not returning to become normal anytime soon. Mm. India has made a choice. China is 
and this choice is very similar and it, it is a confirmist choice that China is going to emerge and is already has emerged in Indian foreign policy as a threat, as a formal threat. But you said in your comments that if I if I got the phrase right, India's position complements China's position. I think on on the on the on the um, uh, Russia Ukraine position on on the Russia Ukraine. But that's a pretty big uh, that's a pretty big carve out of the I mean strategic challenge of China. I mean, again, I think the Chinese position is very clear as far as the Russia Ukraine war is concerned. But I think India's position is not to complement with China, but to overtly or covertly try to be with Russia, not to appear as anti Russia, which actually in a way complements the Chinese position. So I think there is some kind of complementarity, similarity in India and China uh, as far as the Ukraine war is concerned. But that does not mean that Russia. Uh, that doesn't mean that China and India are on the same page when it comes to the Ukraine crisis. I think the Chinese interest is somewhat different. It's, it's for their own US and politics, it's for their US and interest. But India does not really see in that context as far as uh, the Ukraine crisis is concerned. I mean, India is lying low for its own survival because it, it would like to take advantage of the geopolitical situation and would not really appear as a critical factor. And India is definitely not a critical factor. And I know for a fact that in Delhi, uh, when the Ukraine war was uh, started, uh, there was this thing that uh, what India has to do with this war. Mm -hmm. I mean, even though I do, as a scholar, or we can make a point by saying that as a democratic country, as a democratic, uh, as a credible democratic power in the Indo-Pacific regions, India has all the regions to show solidarity with Ukraine and stand affiliate with the Ukrainian cause. But India would uh, probably will have to do that, and India has done that as far as the humanitarian aid is concerned. Mm. So in the humanitarian solidarity, but when it comes to the strategic calculus, mm. I think India has been on the But as far as the China threat is concerned, I think, as I mentioned, coming back to that point, during the pandemic, uh, it has already been, in a way, cited that China is a prominent enemy in, 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 in Indian foreign policy. And therefore, India would not really like to make any concession or any kind of revisiting in its relationship with China, appearing to be a modest power. Uh, in India's interest, it makes sense to improve the relationship with China because we want a stable neighborhood. We want a stable China and India border boundary and region. But that doesn't have to be minister. In fact, if you see, I think there I do agree with the Delhi and Foreign Minister, External Affairs Minister Jayasenko was right by saying that uh, you know, as far as the Chinese are concerned, unless they are really uh, withdrawing the troops, the China India relationship is not returning to normal. So I think that statement explains everything. And, Delhi has uh, drawn a red line as far as China is concerned. That you know, it's 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 no more like a, a business as usual. You need to address the situation on the ground, and India has taken seriously the conflict that has happened within the Congo. So as far as the China issue is concerned, I don't think there is a return line, mm -hmm. and probably Prime Minister Modi would not like to repeat the same mistake that he did in holding. At the, uh, the, the, the the informal summit uh, yeah. during the Wuhan and the uh, I mean uh, today it looks like a, it was a great mistake to trust system because everything is under system and quickly the other questions about I think the strategic autonomy strategic change and all like here one we have to keep in mind is that um, again this is we are living in a very fluid environment fluid, fluid situation right now uh, pandemic is not completely over. Ukraine war is still on. Um, there is an economic recession is happening. So a lot of issues are still evolving and we are still a very in a very transient zone. But I think one of the critical factors that would uh, probably decide Indian foreign policy direction more is that how the European communities are looking at India. As far as India US relations is is concerned, I think there is a key thing. I don't really see that the Ukraine war has emerged as a dividing factor between India and US or between India and Japan. This is just a temporary passing uh, issue. This is a non-issue when it comes to the bilateral relationship between India and US and India and Japan. Uh, probably India is expected to take a more nuanced position, um, you know, aligning with the democratic powers, Indo-Pacific powers. That's why there is an over-expectation in India. But I think a lot will depend how, in what kind of 
politics is emerging as far as the alternative supply chains are concerned, uh, as far as the connectivity politics are concerned, and trade and economic, particularly the FTA uh, agreements are concerned. As you could see, a lot of change is happening in Indian foreign policy as far as the economic and trade uh, uh, nexus is concerned. So there, it would be interesting to see how EU, how US is emerging as a partner as far as the economic configuration is concerned. Let me go. Yeah. Let me go to questions, okay? Because we only have a few minutes left. Yeah, sure. uh, we've got lots of questions, so let me just work my way through. I've got six or seven questions in the room. Maybe some are coming online. Let me quickly start here and go here, and to the gentleman in the back. Uh, there and then we'll go around and then we'll go to this side. Yes, I'll get to you. Hi, my name is Christopher Woody. I'm a journalist for this insider. Um, regarding India's concerns about a more credible Sunday Russian relationship, it sounded like. Just speak a little bit louder, please, so we can get you on the mic here. Yeah, sure. It sounded like that's kind of a wait and see situation to see where the Russia China relationship goes and what that means for India. For, for US policymakers who are seeking closer relations with India, what does that sign a Russian relationship? How should that influence how they engage with India going forward? And let me take one more. Yes. We're really time limited. Yeah, so really brief make... responses. Yes, please. Um, I'm Hassan Gabi from Sekera. Oh, great to see you again. Yeah. Welcome. Um, so, a great presentation. Thank you, Um My presentation, uh, basically on your presentation, you mentioned about the five Cs, um, you know, China's five Cs on India, right? Um, how do you see the immediate periphery of India? I mean, there's a lot of dysfunctionality going on in Sri Lanka, in Pakistan. Yeah. How do you see? How do you assess this uh, dysfunctionality? And can India actually strategically balance the need, or does India need assistance like in the US right now? Because Sri Lanka doesn't have a government. Three cabinets appointed within two months, and serious dysfunctionality. I think mean, Satu was there year ago when I was talking about. How many dysfunctionalities has arrived? So. so, the question about really what is India's take on the Sino Russian alliance? Um, and what is, can India handle its neighborhood without, because it's not going to help get out from Russia or China. Uh, so, does the US matter to that? First of all, Sino Russian relationship, very brief. Really brief, yeah. 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 Uh, I think uh, one point we did not discuss in my presentation, this needs to be understood is that both Russia and India has been a classical factor in terms of checking the Chinese power to some extent. How much they have checked all this while, uh, one probably would not be in a position to quantify that, but from time to time they have succeeded. For example, I think uh, during the, uh, uh, you know, the, the India-China boundary tensions, we think did speak to Xi Jinping in terms of reducing the tensions, so it has worked out in favor of India. But I think this connotation between India and Russia goes uh, towards many decades. If you see uh, during the Soviet Union period, um, you know, there has been multiple occasions where India and Soviet Union and uh, India and Russia supported to a city. For example, you know, um, uh, let's say on, on uh, um, Soviet occupying Afghanistan, India has stayed a little neutral. Um, um, uh, India's Actions on seeking as a full state, Russia has, you know, so Soviet Union did not really react that strong. There has been on Bangladesh issue, when Bangladesh liberation happened um, in, in 1971, uh, it was Soviet Union actually uh, offered a tactical support to, 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 Delhi, to, to India. And uh, eventually, you know, uh, India and Soviet Union were on the same side. Recently, if we talk about a few issues, uh, Russia's support on uh, to force India on the Sino Indian dispute. So, the Sino Russian partnership, and even though rightfully we have all the logic to say that it is going to only stand in, in times to come because of the, after the Ukraine crisis, but I think India can be the deciding factor. And when India made an entry into the Songhai Kutusan organization, it was only with the Russian support. The Russians were very big, uh, you know, uh, they were. They were uh, in favor of India's inclusion, and the Chinese were in favor of uh, Pakistan's inclusion, and that's how the next is. So the, the Russians need India's support as far as issue is concerned. All of this. Thing. So when we talk about sino russian partnership, yes, it is going to evolve. It is going to strengthen. The Chinese would like to strengthen the connectivity issues in the Russian regions, but it, I think the Russians if immediately in near future, the Russians need financial assistance from the Chinese. The Russians might. 
appear to be over supportive towards the Chinese grant and donations, but on the longer term, maybe after three to four years, the Russians will revisit. It depends how Putin is playing its card, but I think India, Modi and Putin and India Russia partnership is a credible one, and therefore there is connection with Russia is not against the US interest. Coming back to the other one, that to what extent um, the neighborhood could be protected or whether India would like to see India. I think this is what I made uh, in my testimony to the US Congress uh, uh, last, uh, I mean, uh, last week, is that the South Asian politics, yes, um, emerge, China is emerging as the critical, most critical power. China has captured substantial market there. And China's relationship with some of the South Asian countries in India's neighborhood, in the immediate neighborhood, is actually strengthening from, from time to time. China is actually dividing India's relationship with Bhutan, with, with Nepal, with Bangladesh, uh, and Pakistan is a known case. But I think there are a couple of things needs to be noted down. Um, no geopolitics in the regions is uh, going to be like a loop from, uh, from, from one another. So when we're talking about South Eastern politics today, it's a critical variable in the Indo-Pacific politics. So US presence is needed. Second, I think US presence is needed for a fact that I think even though we have all the logics, all the facts and figures today to suggest that China has emerged as a stronger economic actor in the South Eastern regions. But if we see China's overall package, China's overall outreach in Asia sub-regions, in different sub-regions, be it Southeast Asia, Central Asia, I think the Chinese are still making their headway to South Asia. Mm -hmm. This is the critical time where India and US needs to do something. And it is very much possible to challenge the Chinese thing if we can talk about Blue Dot Network, if we can talk about cooperation on V3W initiative, if we can talk about supply chain network cooperation that India, Japan, and Australia we have, and US can and Europe, EU can emerge as a stronger partner. So it's very much, and South Asia is a part of that politics. So therefore, when it comes to the neighborhood politics, it's not about boundary discourse. It's not about the relationship. It's about the broader geopolitics factor in connectivity, economic configuration, trade, and growth. And I think there, US. Mm -hmm. uh, partnership is most, most welcome in India, and India would like to see a much more engaging partnership with the US in South Asia. And in the Let me try to take a media. couple more questions. Okay. You have asked them. Um, was there no one on this side? Okay, here with. Did you have a question, sir? Yeah. Please, go ahead. Um, Just introduce yourself and speak so that people online can hear you. Oh, speak up. Yes, please. Oh. Uh, so the world's largest democracy fails to condemn invasion of another democracy. It uh, decides that uh, Bengali Muslims who have lived in the country for 500 years are no longer citizens. It takes away autonomy from Jammu and Kashmir, just the way China takes autonomy away from Hong Kong. And religious rallies are now BJP rallies uniformly. It is, in addition, the rape capital of the world. There is no way to put lipstick on this pig. This is not a country that shales Western values. So, can we look forward to any positive evolution post Modi? And what is Modi's life expectancy? Well, you're asking to look into a crystal ball on uh, domestic issues, but that's a that's certainly one reading of the current state of India, but um, a particular uh, reading of the current state of India. But you know, what is the response? I mean, here we have you laid out the strategic case, and then we have all these domestic issues. You know, Jammu and Kashmir and the you know, domestic politics. So again, it sort of does flow with my question earlier: is what's the bet on India about? And um, is it just a longer term bet? Is it just part of a larger bet? Uh, how, how should we interpret this? I think, I think uh, the, the facts you cited and the reasons you, you just said about, I don't necessarily disagree with you on all of those things, but also I don't agree with you. I think it's more about interpretation. Um, one thing, in fact, I would counter argue by saying that if on the one hand it appears that the power in Delhi is uh, uh, looking much more, uh, you know, um, 
going in other direction than where the Western values or the democratic values are there, it's going in the opposite, opposite direction. But I would also argue by saying in last two to three years, if you see, Delhi has also responded to the authoritarian power the way no other powers in Asia has, resp has had chosen to respond. Uh, the Khan crisis, Delhi responded very strongly and I don't think after 1962 war, this kind of uh, response has been visible. Going there and standing uh, in front of PLA for 73 days, it, 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 it you know, it had showed some kind of courage. Uh, to do Article 370 and kind of nationalistic plan having Jammu and Kashmir was a much needed plan. The kind of activities which is illegal activities which is going on in Jammu and Kashmir and the extremist groups having a overseas connections are definitely not in Indian interest. Look at the way US handled the 9 by 11 incident and the US response after that. So I think it, it does look like a very strong response. But this strong response is based on India's national interest. That, that not necessarily moving away from the democratic ways. And I think every government would like to consolidate their domestic grounds, you know, uh, dealing with the extremist forces, dealing with the illegal activities. And this is what the government in Delhi is doing. So I think there are more reasons to believe that it's a strong government in Delhi. It is in India's national interest. And that's why India is able to stand against China today. Even the China continue to create problems on the boundary suit. But I think if we compare, Delhi's response to China threat has been quite effective. Delhi has gone during the pandemic, has banned the applications. There has been a uh, economic uh, measures uh, taken against China. Uh, strong nationalist planning has emerged. And uh, Delhi has uh, up, uh, emerged as a much more decisive power when it comes to the China threat, the authoritarian, authoritarian threat on the border side. So it is one thing to say that India has moved away from the democratic norms, but it is also uh, makes sense to look at how Delhi has responded to the authoritarian power or the non-democratic power which is emerging as the strongest ever power in human, human civilization. So I think it, it again depends on the interpretations and assessment and I think uh, most of your views are probably based on the negative media interpretation that that is emerging from Delhi. But as I mentioned, probably I would not agree or disagree with you on every point. There are some rational to it, but again, uh, this is in India's interest. If every government has to put their house in order and has to provide a credible foreign policy challenge to a power like China, they have to take some, some steps which are not probably looks uh, quite democratic. Thank you. I, I know there are probably other questions. There are certainly some online, but we, we have come to the close of the 60 minutes we planned for this program, I'm afraid. It's always extremely interesting and enriching to hear from Jagannath. Thank you for making the stop uh, during your testimony to the US-China Security and Economic Review Commission. Really appreciate making a stop at the East-West Center. Let me flag three programs coming up, um, both for our online viewers and those of you here. May 18th, that's later this week, um, at 8 a.m. to 9.30, we're having an assessment of the recent U.S. ASEAN Special Summit uh, with a number of leading scholars and experts from the United States and from the region. That's entirely online, so please join us for that, that program. On Tuesday, May 24th, at 4 in the afternoon to 5.30 Eastern Daylight Time, uh, again online, is a program looking at the in implications of the planned ending of some U.S. assistance under the compacts of free association. For those of you who don't follow regularly the Pacific Islands issues, the compacts of free association are the agreements with the three freely associated states of the Republic of the Marshall Islands, the Republic of Palau, and the Federated States of Micronesia. So we'll be doing that with the General Accountability Office, and uh, Government Accountability Office, I'm sorry, and um, we'll look forward to your participation for those of you interested in uh, Pacific Islands issues. And then the following day, uh, Wednesday, May 25th at 10 a.m., we'll be starting the first in a series of North Korea's relations with the World se Seminar series. We ran a number of those seminars looking at North Korea's relations with Asian countries uh, previously. And this next set of series will look at North Korea's relations with Europe. And we will have um, that at 10 a.m. Uh, on May 25th. Um, and that's uh, looking at the overarching view of North Korea's relations with a number of European 
EU members. And that will be joined by, uh, of course, European experts for that. So stay tuned, and we'll have a number of country-specific studies on North Korea as well. This is part of our North Korea and the World website that the East-West Center runs with the National Committee on North Korea, looking at how North Korea engages the international uh, system. So with those upcoming announcements, it only turned, uh, remains for me to thank Jagannatha once again for coming all the way from Stockholm um, to do a presentation. Thank you all for uh, being our first in our hybrid in-person series. I hope there'll be more of these. We're beginning to sort of test the waters as, uh, as many institutions are. And for those of you who join online, we always welcome you. Please sign up for our newsletter, uh, for our events and publications at the East West Center, and we look forward to seeing you again. Good day. Thank you so much.